Our scripture reading this morning is from 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 10 through 14. 2 Samuel 13, verses 10 through 14. If you're following along in the Pew Bible, that reading begins on page 284, page 284. And I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom that I may eat from your hand. So Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the bedroom to her brother Amnon. When she brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. But she answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. As for me, where could I get rid of my reproach? And as for you, you will be like one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not listen to her, since he was stronger than she. He violated her and lay with her. I'd like to say good morning to everyone. Well, well, wait now. I came way from Duncanville, Texas to be with y'all. Let me do this again. Good morning to everyone. All right. It's good to see all of you and want to say welcome to the Beltline Road Church of Christ. And if you're here visiting with us, we'd like to say that you are a special and honored guest. And now let me get to this lesson because this is a very deep and intense lesson. And it's very sensitive. And the reading that you just read was very horrible, despicable, deplorable. It should have never, ever happened to this beautiful young lady. I want that to be understood. There was no reason for this to happen to this beautiful woman, especially by her own brother. However, I'm not going to focus on particularly what he did. I'm going to focus on what she did. And ironic, well, well, let me just say it this way because I want to be sensitive to the ladies here. The title of my lesson is The Mistakes of Tamar. You heard what I said, The Mistakes of Tamar. Now Chuck, how in the world could you have the audacity to say that this woman made some mistakes after what we just read. We just heard what the brother read, that this woman was clearly violated. That was not her fault at all. That was not a mistake. I want that understood. Her helping her brother was not a mistake. Going to go feed her brother, because we don't have time to read all of it. They had devised a plan her brother, her own brother, had devised a plan to get her there. Her going there was not her mistake. Feeding him was not the mistake. Her fighting him off was not her mistake. What I want to deal with is what she did after she was violated. And brother, I appreciate you reading the reading that you read out of your version because that is a, a very good reading violated and that's exactly what happened to her she was violated but what was her mistakes after hear me well after she was violated and how does that apply to us today because each one of us can be violated maybe not in this sense but each of us can be violated and the point is how do we handle a situation that is traumatic after we have been violated and that's where I'm going and so I do not want us to make the same mistakes that Tamar made after she was violated and mistake number one you take a notes mistake number one 
is that she tried to reason with someone that's unreasonable. Hear me well. After she was violated, she made a mistake in trying to reason with someone that's unreasonable. <clears throat> and I want you to notice right here in verse number 15. <clears throat> after he had did this despicable thing to her, notice verse 15. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise and be gone. Let's just make this plain for you. He told her to get out. Okay? That's very simple. Get out. Get out of my face. Now, where was the mistake? The mistake is found right here in verse 16. And she said to him, There is no cause for this evil, and sending me away is greater than uh, greater than the other that thou didst unto me. Wait, you know what she's saying? She said, no, I will not leave. This is a problem. Folks, listen. She's already been violated. You understand? She's already been violated. What does she need to do? Get out. Because you can make the situation worse. He could have killed her. He could have did something far worse than anything that we can think of. He could have made the, she could have, and he could have made the situation worse. How many times have you had conversations with people and they do not want to hear you? They do not want to listen to you. They are unreasonable. Ladies, let me tell you something to you ladies. When your man says he does not want to talk, get out of my face, and he turns his back, guess what, we do? Guess what you ladies need to do? Don't go in his face and try to make a point to him. Because right then, and that goes for you men, when your ladies do not want to talk to you and you can see that they are bloodshot, red, mad, please do not try to get in their face and try to make a point. Because when you do that, guess what you're trying to do? You're making a point that's pointless. You're going to make the situation worse. Let me give you an example of how this applies, how this applied. This actually happened to me. I was actually having a Bible class, and I had a brother that was with me, and I was a silent partner. And the guy was very, very mad because of what we said about a preacher who was not preaching the truth. You can see him on TV sometimes. I think you've heard of him as T.D. Jakes. I don't mind calling out false prophets. I don't mind that at all. We said that this man does not tell the truth, and he got bloodshot red mad. He was so mad that he did not want to listen anymore. He was so furious with us that he picked up his phone, just like I'm doing, and he said, if you don't get out of my house, I will call the police on you. And he was already starting to dial nine. Well, guess what we did? <laughs> we did what every, every sensible person would do. We got out of there. We didn't stay and try to make a point. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say in Mark 6 in verse number 11? Mark 6 in verse number 11. When you enter into a city or house and they will not hear you or hearken unto you, if they don't want to listen, Jesus said, shake the dust off your feet for a testimony against them. You know what Jesus is saying? Leave. Do not stay and try to make a point that people do not want to listen to. This is the mistake, the first one, that Tamar made. She tried to make a point to a person that was not willing to listen. This is after she was violated. Why in the world would you stay there? Never stay in a situation where you can escalate the thing to make it worse. Is everybody understanding me now? Do not stay in a situation where it could cause you more harm. Because in most cases, people that are that man, they're not going to listen to you anyway. And so what did Jesus say in Matthew 15 and verse number 14? Let them alone. Just making it very plain. That's, this is what Jesus said. To people that do not want to listen, leave them alone. So notice here, that latter part, 
of 2 Samuel 13, verse 16. Notice what, even though she was trying to talk to him, notice what it said about, but he would not hearken under her. He could have cared less what she had to say. So that was mistake number one. Trying to reason with someone that's unreasonable. Never put yourself in a situation like that. Ladies or men. Regardless of the situation. That was the first mistake. Mistake number two. Mistake number two. Let's go on. Verse number 17. Then he called his servants that ministered unto him and said, Put now this. Let's stop right here. The word woman here in the King James Version is in italics. Anyone in here have a King James Version? Did you notice that the word is look a little funny, it's in squiggly lines, it's in italics, or it might have a, a little bar around it? That means that the word is, was not originally there. So what is he really saying? He really is saying, put this out of here. Get this out of here. You know what he did? He dehumanized. He'd already violated, but now he doesn't care that she's even a woman, a human now. He's dehumanized this woman. So now, not sister, not woman, just get this out of here. So he's not valuing her at all. So since he doesn't value her, where's, where's Tamar's mistake? Now, after he put out, Notice, and she had a garment of divers colors upon her. For such were robes of the king's daughters that were virgins, apparel. Then the servants, they brought her out and bolted the door behind her. And Tamar put ashes on her and rent her garment. Folks, let me ask you, is Tamar still royalty? Yes. Is Tamar still beautiful yes is Tamar still valuable yes is Tamar still worthy to be married yes I would marry her I don't care what happened to her I would still be with her she's beautiful she's royalty and all that she still has her essence even though she was violated she's still a valuable person but when she took that coat and ripped it you know what she was doing to herself? She's devaluing herself now. This is a mindset that's in her. I know she's traumatized, and this is a traumatic experience. When she ripped that coat, she's now saying, I'm not worth anything now. Because that's what people do when they mourn. They feel like it's their fault. It wasn't her fault. Her mistake was is that she falls into the mindset of people that when they are violated, they give up on God. What am I saying here? When a person obeys the gospel of Christ, what do they put on? They put on Christ. So Galatians 3, 26 and 27, when a person is baptized into Christ, they put on Christ. Christ clothes you. He makes you worthy to come before him. He's, he deems you valuable. You belong to the king. You are in his kingdom. And so you are worth something to Jesus Christ. In fact, even if you're not in the kingdom, you're still worth something to Jesus Christ. Why? Because what did Jesus do to make us all valuable to him? The brother just prayed it. He died for everybody, which means that Jesus deemed everybody valuable that's on this planet. No one has the right to devalue you, even though people do not care about you or about your essence or about your skin color, or about your makeup or about your race. God deems you valuable. I want that to be understood. And so when problems or traumatic experiences happen to people, please do not give up on God. When you put Christ on in baptism, leave it on regardless of the situation that happens to you. How many people have given up on God and ripped Christ off of their life, have torn Christ off, and they blame God for what happened to them? You know some people that are like this. See, this message is not just for women. It's for everybody. And so this is the problem that people have when something traumatic happens to them. They tend to rip the relationship 
with Christ. I'm telling you, when you obey the gospel of Christ, keep Christ on regardless of what happens to you. Is everybody understanding this? Yes, it can be traumatic. Yes, you can go through hard times. But never rip your relationship with Christ because you belong to the king. You are in his kingdom and Christ deems you valuable regardless of how old you are, how young you are, how pretty you are, how ugly you are. It doesn't matter. To God, you are always valuable. I don't ever want us to ever forget that regardless of what some human being thinks of you. So now, Tamar's problem was she ripped that coat. She needed to leave it on because she's still valuable. She still belongs to the king. She's still beautiful. And she still has value to a man. She didn't think like that anymore. In fact, she went on, she went on weeping. So that's her second mistake. She's in the mindset that now I'm not valuable to anybody. What was her third mistake? Her third mistake is found here in verse number 20. You know, let me say this before I go here. When something traumatic happens to people, make sure that you go to the right source. If I am dying of cancer and I have a cure for it, do I need to go to a mechanic to try to get the cure? No, <laughs> that, would, that would be foolish. I'll never forget this story. That was a young man who was being bullied. He was being bullied. And so the bully was chasing after him. And so what the young man did, he went to a house and there was a guy sitting there on the porch. And the guy on the porch started laughing at the kid because that was the bully's uncle. So when the kid went to the house, did he go to the right source or did he get himself in more trouble? He got himself in more trouble. What am I telling you? When you are in a situation where you need help, please do not go to the wrong source. What's Tamar's mistake? Her third one. She went to the wrong source. Verse 20. Here it is. And Absalom, her brother, said unto her, Have Abnon thy brother been with thee? Okay. Well, what's wrong with going with going to her brother, Absalom? What's wrong with that? He's in the kingdom, right? Yeah. He's royalty, right? The problem is. Not everybody that's in your household is right. Does anybody agree with that? Name Now, everybody in here, you have relatives and you know some of your relatives. Some of your relatives are no good. That's the reason why you don't have them come to your house. Because you know that they're no good. Not everybody that's kin to you is right. Let me make it spiritual. Not everybody that's in the church of Christ is right just because they're in the Lord's church that doesn't mean that you need to go to them for advice there are some members of the Lord's church that are clearly no good do you need to take advice from them that I'm gonna answer that for you no because some people that are in the church they really don't mean you any good and you have to be aware of them, especially taking advice from them, especially when you are in need of help. Absalom is no good. When you can continue to read about Absalom, you'll find out that Absalom is a very evil person. Why in the world did she go to him? You don't read anywhere in this text that she, first of all, she didn't go to God. You don't see that. She didn't go to her father, David. You don't see that. Why go to a person that cannot help you? You know, I want you to jot this down for your notes. Psalm 1 and verse number 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. Absalom is ungodly.
godly. And who does she go to? She goes to the person that she does not need to go to. In fact, if you go to the wrong source, guess what you'll end up getting? The wrong advice. You understand that? The wrong advice. Young ladies and men, when you're in school and you tell your grandkids this or your children this, when you have friends in school, don't listen to some of your friends when they want to have you go do some things. No. They could give you some bad advice. Hey, let's skip school. Hey, let's go do... No. Proverbs 1 and verse number 10, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. Do not listen to ungodly advice. Do not listen to ungodly people. Do not go to the wrong source. This is what I want to be understood here. She went to Absalom. This is the wrong person to go to. And in fact, look at the advice that she gave him, that he gave her. Notice what he said. Uh, have Amnon, thy brother, been with thee? Notice what he said. But hold now thy peace, my sister. Uh-uh. No, no, no. Listen, let me tell you something. I mean this with all sincerity. If you've been violated in any kind of way, I don't care what it is, say something. But say something to the right people. I'm noticing it's a lot of older people here. One of these days, you might be where my dad is. My dad is in a nursing home. He has to be there. But I told him one thing. I told him one thing. If a person in this facility touches you, violates you in any kind of way, you say something. You know what he told me? Well, son, I don't want you to get mad. Don't worry about me getting mad. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need you worrying about that. That's not what you need to tell me. If your kids are being bullied, you tell them to say something. I'll come out there with them. I mean that. If you women have been violated in any kind of way, I don't care, what, it doesn't have to be sexual. It can be anything. If you have been violated in any kind of way, you say something. Don't wait 25 years later and then want some justice. Don't do that. Do it right then to the right person, to the right source. Older men, if you've been violated, Say something. Yes, it might be embarrassing. It might be hard. It might be traumatic. But first of all, don't leave God out of the equation. That's the right source. And secondly, make sure you go to the right source. Do not make the same mistakes as Tamar made by going to the wrong source and then getting the wrong advice by not saying anything. You have the right as a human being to say something. You have a God-given right. God blessed you with a mouth to say something. And if something is happening to you, make sure that you say something to the right source. Is everybody understanding this? This means yes. This means no. This is, I have no idea what you're talking about. I think you understand where I'm going here. Violations of any kind should not be tolerated from anybody on any kind of level. This is what the Bible is showing you what not to do when you are violated. And hope to God that you will never violate, but if you have been, please say something to the right people the right source and always go to God about it Tamar she went to her brother and her brother gave her the wrong advice so and guess what mistake number four it's found right here in verse 20 after he gave her that bad advice it says here so Tamar remained desolate in her brother's Absalom's house. Desolate there means she did absolutely nothing with herself. Nothing. In fact, 
This is the last time you see Tamar in the Bible period. This is the last time you ever see of her. What's the problem with that? If Tamar remains desolate, what this desolate means? It means that you are doing nothing. There is nothing done. You're not productive. She could not move on. There are some people that have been violated and they just cannot get over it. It's 20, 30, 10 years. It still has a grip on them. It makes them unproductive. They can't go anywhere. They can't talk to anybody. They don't want to do anything. They stay in the woe is me stage. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? They stay there. Does God want us to stay in a situation where you're desolate? No, he does not. God wants us to be productive. If you are still breathing right now, even after you've been violated, you know what, you, you know what happened to you? God blessed you to move on. He blessed you. He blessed you to the point to where you can overcome anything that has done you bad. You can over, with God's help, you can move on from it. You do not have to stay in a desolate situation. In fact, God expects for you to come out of a desolate, desolate situation. Have we been in desolate situations before? Yes. What am I talking about? We were in our sins. What did God expect for us to do? To come out of it. He gave us instructions on how to come out of sin. In Tamar's situations, Tamar didn't sin. It's not what I'm saying about her. Tamar didn't sin at all. Tamar's problem was she stayed there and she was never productive. She never had any kids. You don't see anything. In fact, Absalom had a child and he named the child after Tamar. When you keep on reading about it. But as far as Tamar, you don't see anything else about Tamar ever again. Now, let me ask you something. What if Jesus Christ was like Tamar? What if Jesus Christ was like her? What would happen? What if Jesus, after, after the brother just prayed about how Jesus was violated, was Jesus violated? Yet he was violated to the worst degree. He went through a mock trial, which is nonsense. He was lied on, then he was beaten, stripped naked, and I mean totally naked. That little cute little stuff where he have on semi-clothes, no, he was totally naked. To shame him. They beat him, spit on him, and then they ridiculed him. Is that humiliation? Is that a violation? Now what if Jesus would have stayed desolate? What if he'd have had the mindset of Tamar? What if he'd had the mindset of some of us where we just, oh my goodness, I can't function anymore. Some people have been in a traumatic situation to the point to where now they have to take medicine now. I'm not making fun of that. We should never get to the point to where our mind is just so blown away that we can't function anymore. This is where I'm going with this. This is the problem with Tamar. She stayed there. No record of her ever again should we be like that the answer is no if Jesus would have been like this we would never have been saved because had this had happened to me and then I had to die for everybody guess what I'm not doing it <laughs> I'm not dying for you Uh, uh. you've beat me spit on me punched me kicked me made fun of me, and you think that I'm, I'm going to die for you? No, I'm not doing that. No. But thank God that Jesus is not me. And thank God that Jesus is not like any of us. Jesus took that humiliation to the point to where he proved to us that he loved us so much. The creature is beating on the creator, and the creator still died for the creature and still loved the creature enough to where he wanted to save his own creation. Who does that? There's only one man that did that. That's Jesus. He did not stay desolate. 
And what I'm telling you, I don't want you, regardless of what happened to you, do not stay desolate in your situation. Now, there's a scripture that I want us to go to. There's a scripture that I want us to go to. I want us to go to Philippians right quick. Philippians chapter 3. And then we're going to wrap this thing up. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians is found in the New Testament. I'm saying that because I'm still turning over there. Philippians chapter 3. And I want us to take a look at 12. Philippians 3, 12 through 14. I want us to notice something. 12 through 14. Now, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I followed after, if that I may apprehend that which is also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to apprehend it, meaning that I'm not there yet. But this one thing I do. Notice what he said. Forgetting those things which are behind. And reaching forth under those things which are before. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I'm not letting the things that's going on in my past hold me back. Are y'all understanding this? Do not let whatever the traumatic experience or whatever the experience is hold you back. You have a you have a hope that you have something to look forward to. What do we have to look forward to? That's going to heaven, regardless of how bad our life may be here. And some of us have lived pretty good lives. But what about those that have not lived good lives? Paul said you have something to look forward to. Forget that stuff that's going on to the point to where it holds you to where you're unproductive. Paul is saying keep moving on. Move forward. Notice verse 14. I press toward, meaning he's moving on. Toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. God has something better for you than this miserable life that some of us have to live. It's something better. Jesus had to live a miserable life while he was down here. The Bible says over in Isaiah 53, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Does that sound like he had a good life down here? No. But he put up with it. He put up with it. He dealt with it. And he moved on. Even though he knew he was going to have to suffer, bleed, and die. Because God had promised him that if you go through that, I have something better for you on the other side. And guess what God is telling us today? Put up with this nonsense for a while. I have something better for you on the other side. Yes, it's difficult. John 16 and verse number 33, you jot that down for your notes. In this world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, if Jesus has overcome the world, guess what he's going to help us do? Overcome the same miserable things that's down here. And once you overcome that, Jesus will still be with you. Do not give up on Jesus. So, don't make the same mistakes as Tamar. Do not make those same kind of mistakes. Don't try to reason with someone that's unreasonable. Do not try or do not devalue yourself. You're valuable to God. Do not go to the wrong source. And do not, and do not ever give up on God and stay desolate. Don't stay in the same situation. You can come out of it with God's help. Now, with Jesus going through that humiliation, he did that for our, on our behalf by dying for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's found in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. We must believe that. That's what you call the gospel. That's the power of God to save us from our sins. Romans 1 and verse number 16 and 17. Do you believe that gospel? I'm hoping that you do. Believe that gospel, John 8, 24. Once you believe that gospel, 
Repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3 and verse number 5. Then make the confession that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. Once you make that confession, we'll baptize you and all that nonsense and all those sins that you've committed will be washed away forever. Acts 22, 16. The Lord will add you to his kingdom and there you will be valuable to the Lord. You can share in his glory. And if something does happen to you, because one thing that I do know, we've been violated as humans by Satan. Satan has violated us. But Jesus is one day going to deal with Satan. And if we die faithful, we won't ever have to worry about Satan or any other despicable human ever again to violate us. And I'm looking forward to that. So now... If you have any concerns or any requests, please make it known while we together stand and sing. Come on.